Welcome to the Sea Analysis Podcast. I'm your host, Chaz Nuttycomb, the director of Sea Analysis. Today, I'm joined by Andrea McClellan. She's a member of the Norfolk City Council. She's running to be the next Lieutenant Governor of Virginia. Councilman McClellan, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Chaz. Happy to be here. So tell us a little bit more about who you are and what got you in the race for Lieutenant Governor of Virginia. Well, I uh, currently serve, as you mentioned, on the Norfolk City Council. I was elected in May of 2016 and represent 125,000 Virginians, uh, which is actually the largest constituency of anybody running in the lieutenant governor's race. Uh, By background, uh, my family moved to Virginia when I was seven. For my dad's job, we moved to Virginia Beach, and I was educated in Virginia Beach public schools. Unfortunately, a few years after we arrived, uh, my dad left, and uh, my mom became a single mom who at that point had never worked outside of the home and had to figure out how to make ends meet for my brother and me. And so uh, my story basically starts and is foundational with the community college system. Mom went back to TCC, Tidewater Community College, and she took a handful of classes and became a draftsman or a technical illustrator and worked in the local government contracting space. And that's how she put food on the table for my brother and me. So her tenacity and her resilience is really sort of foundational to who I am. After graduating from Green Run High School, I had a class of 850 kids my senior year. By the way, that's where I got my start in politics. I was student council president there. I went on to the University of Virginia and Uh, Thanks to four years of work-study jobs and two years as an RA to pay for room and board, was able to graduate from there, uh, along with some student loans, uh, which we can talk about. Uh, And then I I worked um, in industrial sales and marketing for two Fortune 500 companies uh, before I I actually ran two small startup companies of my own. Then my husband and I moved back to Hampton Roads uh, right before our first son was born. And when we moved back here, I realized there are a lot of families like my mom who were also suffering and and having a hard time making ends meet. And so I got involved in the community and served on a variety of boards and volunteered for organizations um, and used my business background essentially to help raise awareness and raise funds for causes that helped homeless families and victims of domestic violence and uh, helped to run a a small uh, nonprofit venture. It was basically a a business uh, that we collected used books from the community and um, sold them online. But the folks who ran the program were people who had recently been incarcerated. And it was a reentry program to help with job training skills and reduce recidivism. And um, that was really a, a fabulous organization. And I still stay in touch with a lot of the folks from that program now. Um, in 2008, I got back involved in politics. I became a precinct captain for our local Norfolk City Democratic Committee. Uh, and for the first time, I knocked on doors and made phone calls and got really, really excited about the political process and started raising money and uh, funds for great candidates uh, up and down the ballot. Uh, I served uh, in 2014 and 2015, actually, for the Democratic Party of Virginia. I served as vice chair of finance. And then in 2016, I decided to run against a 16-year incumbent here in Norfolk for the city council seat that I hold today. It was an interesting and very challenging race. The gentleman that I ran against hadn't done anything wrong, but he just hadn't done anything. And and I was really focused on running for the future of Norfolk and innovation and access and transparency, you know, all the things that I've similarly am, am writing for today. And I was told at the time that th- there's no way I would win and that I wouldn't raise enough money. And one gentleman was bold enough to explain to me that they pick a businessman in Norfolk and they raise money for him. And that's, I just wouldn't have a chance. I beat him in 19 of 23 precincts though. And I raised him dollar for dollar. And I Attribute that to just the great A team that we put together then. Um, And I have a great A team now, volunteers and staff and a vision. Um, So I'm excited to basically continue the work that I've been doing locally, you know, focusing on creating more access to opportunity, whether that's providing better broadband connections, more affordable high speed internet, uh, focusing on the environment and creating a future for our kids and our grandkids where uh, we've reduced our carbon footprint and hopefully mitigated the flooding uh, that occurs so frequently in my area, uh, focusing on creating more access to transit. I serve as vice chair of our public transit authority here, uh, which is fun because my my grandfather um, drove a bus for 40 years in St. Petersburg, Florida. So it sort of comes to me naturally there. And then also helping small businesses like the one I ran create access to capital and, um, and then for the, on the workers, making sure that we have more workforce development programs, community colleges and trade schools, uh, like the programs that my mom accessed. So having a lot of fun locally, looking forward to taking the knowledge uh, and the network that I've built regionally, statewide and nationally and putting it to work as the next lieutenant governor. 
All right. So four years ago in the 2017 Democratic primary for governor, you endorsed your fellow resident of Norfolk, Ralph Northam. I'm assuming that since now you yourself uh, are a statewide candidate, uh, you're not planning on making any endorsements this time this time around. Is that a safe assumption? I'm not endorsing in any of the other statewide races. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Um, listen, any candidate running would be better than a Republican candidate in my mind. Um, and I, with few exceptions, I've supported everybody running on the statewide ballots previously, um, helping their previous campaigns. And so we've got some amazing candidates and I'm, I'm excited that we have so many people who've stepped up and who are willing to put their, their hat in the ring. It's hard running statewide. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but uh, we've got some great folks. So I'm, I'll be interested to see what the outcome is on June 8th for those other two races for sure. Well, it's a shame because I was thinking maybe you should endorse Jennifer McClellan for governor. It, it, it would save you ink for printing uh, if y'all are the nominees and you can easily do joint ads with just McClellan for governors at the end. I've heard that comment before. So listen, Jen McClellan is, is amazing and it would be fun to run with her, but you know, I'd be happy to run with Terry McAuliffe or Jennifer Carroll Foy or Justin Fairfax or Lee Carter. You know, I think it's going to be interesting. I, it's a, um, uh, yeah, um, I'll let that horse race play out. I'm just focused on staying in my lane and uh, trying to be victorious on June 8th for the Lieutenant Governor's role. Fair game. Well, in our recent first piece on the Lieutenant Governor race, I wrote that you are one of the four candidates who actually has a shot at winning the Democratic primary. Uh, the other three are Delegate Sam Rasool, former Fairfax NAACP Chairman Sean Perryman, and Delegate Hala Ayala. What is the difference between these uh, candidates' agendas and yours? You know, some of it's experience and some of it's agenda and some of it's personality. Uh, number one, uh, geographically, I represent Hampton Roads. I'm the only LG candidate in the Democratic primary from this area, which is the second largest voting bloc in uh, the Commonwealth. I am also the only candidate who brings a local government experience and background. So understanding how cities and counties and towns works is important. And oftentimes that's, that's missing in the agenda in Richmond. You know, we've seen unfunded mandates and well-intentioned legislation that doesn't always translate when it comes down to the local level uh, where we have to implement laws and uh, the funding's not there to help us. And so we have to divert funding that goes to schools or roads or things like that. So being that, uh, that person who can bridge uh, between those two is important. Uh, as an example, the last person who brought that knowledge to the role of Lieutenant Governor was Tim Kaine, who previously had been on the, served on the North of uh, the Richmond City Council and as Richmond mayor. And I think he did a pretty darn good job. So I think that's a, certainly another um, area that I bring my background in the business community and understanding how businesses work. And I think that's going to be important as well. We need to grow more jobs, good paying jobs. And to, to grow jobs, you need to have um, good businesses as well. So I think I, I definitely have a strong skill set there that I can bring to the table. Um, so I, I would just say because of my local government background, because of my business background, I think I'm the pragmatic, practical leader in the group who has built a lot of coalitions, has, has gotten a lot of work done and uh, is, is excited about you know, moving the ball forward. And I think um, those are the general skills that I bring to the table. I, I, you know, 30 years of experience has allowed me to understand a lot of different issues, uh, provide me with a lot of different um, knowledge and networks that I can access, uh, whether it's at the, the regional estate or the, um, the national level. So, well, are, are there any uh, substantial policies of yours uh, that differ from the aforementioned candidates? I think what you'll see with all of the candidates, we generally agree on what, where we need to go in uh, for mm -hmm. the Commonwealth and for our future. I mean, we all understand that we need to be focusing um, on equity. We need to make sure that we're focusing on creating more good paying jobs, um, creating more affordable health care options, ensuring that our education system is strong and equitable and um, we've got better uh, pay for our teachers, um, increase broadband. I mean, I think we're, we're all pretty similar in that regard. Uh, some of us might focus differently. Um, we might frame things a little bit differently, but I think generally policy-wise, I don't think there's a lot of disagreement there. So you're the only one in this race, as you've said, who's been in municipal government. Uh, how do you think that experience is going to translate to a statewide role, though? Uh, really well. You know, I think as lieutenant governor, which of course we preside over the Senate, we break ties, uh, you act as the wingman to the governor. 
And so whatever the governor's agenda, you, you, you're an active partner there. Uh, one of the things that I would love to suggest to the governor in my role as lieutenant governor is to act as a board member to the Virginia Municipal League, which represents the cities and the towns of Virginia and the Virginia Association of Counties, which as the name implies, represents the counties to have that connection. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we talk a lot about the need for more civics education with our kids and our school system, which by the way, I completely agree with, but I would suggest that we also need a lot of civics education for our adults. And as Lieutenant Governor, I would love to uh, take on that challenge and have a dog and pony show talking about Virginia Government 101 and working with our cities and counties and towns and being out there and making that connection and explaining to constituents exactly how things work at the state level um, and, and bridging between the locality and, uh, and state government. So in my view, municipal government is oftentimes far less partisan and ideological in daily operation than say at the state level. It is. Um, is, is that part of your philosophy? Do you believe <clears throat> compromise and consensus is more important or should Democrats in Virginia be a little bit more aggressive about using what leverage uh, they have in the blue state, blue commonwealth to implement as such of their agenda as possible, which is more like how the legislature usually works. Well, I mean, I think the General Assembly's done amazing work um, in taking advantage of the fact that we have three statewide offices and that we have the the majority in the House and the Senate. And so I commend them and I think that's great. And I think we need to continue along those lines. And quite honestly, I think it's really important as we consider this primary what that state, um, uh, what that state ticket looks like, so that we can ensure that we maintain the majority in the House in November as well. Um, and I, I don't take that for granted whatsoever. Yes, you're absolutely right that local government is less partisan in nature because, quite honestly, filling a pothole or fixing a streetlight doesn't have a D or an R next to it. And I think that's a real skill that I bring to the table. The fact that I chair the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission, which represents 17 municipalities or 1.7 million Virginians, and we get together once a month, rural counties that are very red, urban cities like Norfolk and Hampton that are very blue, um, and the very suburban and exurban areas, whether it's Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, or James City County. And we all sit around a table, Republicans and, and Democrats alike, and we get things done. We've, we've passed a resolution to ban offshore drilling. Uh, we've passed a resolution uh, in support of offshore wind, which we're really leaning in on that. Um, we're working together on the issue of vaccine distribution, which, by the way, did not go so well initially uh, and during the uh, rollout at the local level. And, and we wrote a letter to the governor. All 17 municipalities agreed to it and said, hey, listen, here's, here's where things could work better and here's how we could plug in. Um, I think that ability to work together is uh, is a really strong skill set and one that I I think um, differentiates me for sure. And so I, I think that would only be an asset. And recognizing the Lieutenant Governor, when you're not in the Senate, you have a statewide platform to convene the best and the brightest resources. Uh, and whether that's private industry, whether that's nonprofits, academia, um, uh, you, you work together to address issues like broadband, uh, small business, the environment. And, and in those cases, uh, I don't think this should be partisan. I think what we're trying to do is um, advance Virginia and, and address some of those very important needs. So the fact that I can build those coalitions is definitely an, an area where I think I excel. So after the conviction of Officer Chauvin on all three counts, how do you see our criminal justice system back here at home in the Commonwealth? Uh, is there progress on this issue that can still be made? Well, the General Assembly's done some really heavy lifting, and I applaud them. At the local level, I think that we we have the ability, the permission now to create a criminal, or excuse me, a citizen review panel. I, I've been advocating for that in Norfolk, and I hope that we'll be setting that up here shortly. I'd like to see that with subpoena powers. Um, so there's a lot of things that we could be doing at the local level uh, to increase funding to ensure that our, our local police um, are trained better. Um, and that we also are recruiting so that our, our, our police departments look like the communities that they serve. I think that's really important as well. There's some other things that we could do with criminal justice reform, for sure. You know, one of the things that I haven't heard mentioned is the idea of creating more parity of the pay of our public defender's office uh, with our prosecutors. And ensuring that we've got really good attorneys as public defenders is going to be important. I think it's uh, to provide equity. 
Uh, so I'd like to see more of that. Recognizing that Virginia has such a high population of veterans, uh, I'd like to see us lean in on this idea of veterans treatment courts. Uh, Virginia only has four of those versus a state like Wisconsin that has 50. And essentially what that does is it reduces recidivism of our veterans who are going through our court system for whatever reason and, um, and providing them with better resources, uh, whether it's mental health resources, substance use disorder resources, et cetera. So I think that those are a couple of areas that I haven't heard talked about recently, but I'd like to add to the list and would certainly advocate for those for sure. So last summer, some members on the Norfolk City Council, uh, as well as mayor, were, were pushing to make thousands of records from the Norfolk uh, Police Department on the use of force by officers public after calls from uh, Black Lives Matter activists. According to a piece I read in the Virginian pilot, uh, you opposed releasing those full records. Why was that? And do you still feel the same? I think I was with the majority and the mayor on this issue in terms of it needed to be released, but they should go through a process so that if there was any personnel information that was inappropriate, that that would be redacted. That's honestly why I called for the creation of a citizen review panel so that they would have access to those in complete detail. Um, that that I'm very much in favor of, but to go out uh, with all that information without uh, any context, I think would be, I think that you need to have the citizen review panel as a, a step in between. So I definitely support that. That's why I've been focused on the creation of that, similar to the model that they have in Austin, Texas. Okay. Well, so you're running to be the president of the Senate. So I want to know how you think the Senate's doing. Some Democrats, I know they've said uh, they've passed a lot of monumental legislation, but they've also simultaneously cut back or killed a lot of progressive priorities like paid sick leave, private prison abolition. Uh, is there legislation that has failed in the chamber you wish had passed? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the issues that are in the chamber that would come up for potentially a <clears throat> tie-breaking vote that I'm really concerned about and where I'm, I'm excited to be serving in that role would be particularly as it relates to reproductive health care. I'm hoping that we will see a, a movement to create a constitution something that's um, in the constitution that enshrines reproductive health care. And I suspect based on the current makeup of the Senate, that that would be a tie breaking vote. So that's definitely something that I would, I would lean in on there and, um, and and hope to to be that, uh, that person who casts that tie breaking vote. Should Dominion Energy stay in private hands? Should Dominion Energy, are you suggesting that it becomes uh, just a complete public corporation? Public utility, yeah. You know, I haven't thought about that, Chaz. I I don't, I I think what needs to happen is there needs to be stronger oversight of the State Corporation Commission. And I think some of the recent appointments, we're going to see that. That's where I think the the change needs to happen. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I greatly appreciate your time. As I said, you're one of the four candidates in this race uh, for the Lieutenant Governor Democratic primary, which is on June 8th. Uh, for those listening and uh, here in Virginia, I want to vote in the primary. Uh, you're one of the four who has a shot at this nomination. If you do become a nominee, I'd love to have you on uh, again closer to the general election. Uh, and we can talk again there. That sounds great, Chaz. Let's do that. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks. Take care.